Hello, welcome back to our course of the Economic History of Latin America. I am Ivan Luzardo, a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Economy at the University of Pennsylvania. I am delighted to introduce you uh, Fernando Arteaga, who is the academic, uh, the academic director of the Penn Initiative for the Studio of the Market, and uh, who will be our lecturer for today. So welcome back, Fernando. I will share my screen. Okay, so let's start. So this portrait here, I, this is a painting, a mural painting by Diego Rivera, it's located in Mexico City. And I think it portrays quite well the way in which Latin American societies today capture the feelings about the conquest and the colonization. It's like a living scar that reminds us of our past and reminds us where we came from and basically reminds us of who we are. So here, of course, we can see the conquerors, the Spanish conquerors, the violent aspects of the conquest, but also more or less the missionaries protecting the indigenous people against the conquerors, but they, they themselves kind of forcing the religion onto the indigenous populations that of course have to work in a coerced manner. So what we are going to be talking today is specifically about how we build the Latin American societies we have today in terms of the core institutions. So remind you the aspects that we cover in the first week, some key traits of the region where basically a lot of inequality, you will see that start here more or less with of course a racial component. We will also see that there is a strong emphasis on the extraction of resources. So the economies that are based on extracting commodities will also start here. Of course, more famous silver and gold, but also sugar and tobacco in, of the, in some of the regions in the Caribbean will be so important for the development of these regions. So a quick outline of what we will be covering is basically first we will talk about why Spain and Portugal colonized the region, and we'll be focusing pretty much in understanding the governance institutions that led first to the conquest and led first to the initial governance institutions within America itself. We will talk about how they adapted to the pre-Hispanic era, and we will talk about the complexities in the conflicts in between the conquistadores, the crown, and the missionaries. Next lecture on Thursday, we'll cover more about the economic trajectories, the trading routes, merchant guilds, and fiscal and state capacity, and the Bourbon reforms in Spain and the Pambolin reforms in Portugal that led that were immediate to the eve of independence. So moving on to start, let's look into the question of why specifically Spain and Portugal. So take a look at this map, which is more or less portrays the political configuration of Europe in the 15th century. And of course, one of the most evident aspects that has not changed, of course, is that both Spain and Portugal are on the geographical periphery of Europe. That means that, of course, they are close to the Atlantic. And in that sense, they have kind of a geographical advantage. But what I want to emphasize here is that the main economic driver towards trying to find, not the Americas, but finding and moving into the ocean was basically looking into spices. So at this time, basically what you see is that the Ottoman Empire with a coalition with the, the Italian republics in the North, Genoa and Venice and Pisa, basically control the, sp the spice trade between Asia and Europe. So of course, there's a huge motivation by the other nations across Europe in order to basically try to find alternative routes to these spices in Southeast Asia. So most naturally, the ones that enjoyed the geographical advantage would try to move through the sea. So I think this other map captures quite well, well the geographical advantage that Portugal and Spain had compared to other European countries. We already talked about the economic driver, but geographical constraints, of course, are also quite relevant. And here is the Atlantic. What we see here is basically that, of course, Spain and Portugal are closer, but these are the trade winds. So that means that it is easier to move from Spain to Americas than, say, to England to Americas. Here's they go against the winds. And most importantly, perhaps, is that when they go to the south, and to the east, they actually are, to the west, sorry, they are actually improving the weather conditions that they face. So that they are becoming better and better. And if we compare that to an alternative question, not to say just why Portugal and Spain against England, 
But let's look at why China did not conquer America, did not colonize America. And if you look at the huge differences in terms of the size of the Pacific and the Atlantic, which I think this map portrays quite well, you can understand how more improbable would the, the, the circumstances would be for the Chinese to come to America in the very first place. So the size of the Pacific Ocean is so large that basically all the land mass in the earth can actually uh, is enough to fit within the Pacific Ocean. For everyone that has actually fly fly and make flights from uh, America to Asia, to Australia, to Japan, or to China, they know how long that trip is. And related to the other aspect that I was just talking to you about is that if you want to go to America, you have to go basically your wars, your environmental conditions that you face, you have to go north. So here you're going, going for warmer environments to actually colder and colder environments. So the likelihood of the Chinese actually coming into the Americas in the first place is quite low comparing to the likelihood of the Europeans and specifically the Spanish and the Portuguese. And a second aspect that I think worth mentioning is precisely how were the institutions implemented before the arrival of the Spaniards to America. There were already some of them that had a previous, uh, th that were more or less uh, experimented within other areas. Here are the islands of Macaronesia on the coast of Africa. Three of these belong to uh, Portugal. Azores and Madeira still, are still part of Portugal. Cape Verde is an independent country now, but they were initially colonized by the Portuguese. And the Canary Islands were colonized by the Spaniards. And what I want to emphasize is when we talk, and we'll be talking a lot about the encomienda system, which of course has a negative connotation in the Americas because of the explo exploitation that the conquerors had when they arrived and they basically made the indigenous people work for them. So that institution was not new. They had already been proving, uh, they had already been using them in the Canary Islands. And even, that, even before that, in the process of the reconquest of Spain, remember that more or less starting in the 8th century up until the 15th century, the whole Iberian Peninsula had been suffering the, the process of the Muslim conquest. So there was a border zone between Christians and Muslims that created a lot of conflict. And given that the uh, kingdoms in this area did not enjoy a lot of state capacity, the kings and crowns were not particularly rich and not particularly powerful in terms of cap the capacity of organizing people, the way in which they had to actually incentivize the reconquering of some areas is by more or less outsourcing the process towards these private parties, the, what later would become the conquistadores, and they will conquer and how they were incentivized well, they were incentivized to conquer by letting them actually have a piece of the land. And basically they were being entrusted. That's basically the meaning of the word encomienda in Spanish. It's an consignment of the land and the people that exist there towards this encomendero, this conquistador, and they would have right over the population there. So they already had experience here. And then the Spanish had more experience in the Canary Islands. What's particularly different about the Canary Islands compared to the Portuguese islands is that these were already settled by inhabitants before uh, that were uh, indifferent to, to, to the Europeans. So they had to fight a, a conquest war. And again, a lot of the experience that they would see in the conquest of the Canary Islands, which was a gruesome conquest that lasted for a lot of decades, for almost 50 years, as we see here in this map, well, they will be implemented as well into the Americas. And if we look into the Portuguese, we also see some, also the Portuguese islands here were not inhabited. What you will see, start seeing is that the first economic drivers towards uh, settling these areas will already appear here. So for example, one of the first sugar plantations will pop up here in this in this um, in these Portuguese islands. Of course, sugar plantations then would become a core aspect of the Portuguese colonization of Brazil. And if you want to know more, there's a huge literature on this. I would recommend first the classic Spanish Seaborne Empire by John Parry, which talks about this idea that both Spain and more or less Portugal as well, of course, were the first seaborne empires compared to the traditional uh, empires that were based on land. If you want to look in a more recent book, I would recommend Roger Crowley's book on the voyages of discovery and conquest of the Portuguese. 
But let's look a little bit closer into the process of the voyages and why they were important. First, we need to understand, as I was retelling, telling you, telling you before, is that the kingdoms here did really were not states in the same manner as they are today. So they, of course, had funds because they received the the taxes were paid to them, but they were not rich or powerful enough to organize all the projects by themselves. So they had to rely more or less on a private public cooperation. So Columbus, I guess, is one of the most famous. He's the first, of course, person that came to America. And he famously, of course, went first to the King of Portugal. He was denied because as we will see in just a moment, the Portuguese had a larger experience navigating across the water. So they knew that more or less for uh, Columbus calculations estimates about the size of the world were wrong. So they did not want to fund his project. His brother, uh, his younger brother of Columbus actually went to England as well, looking for uh, funding for the project. And then they went to Spain and the Spain, uh, what, well, to Castile uh, and, and the kings of, the queen of Castile and the king of Aragon. Well, they said, of course, yes, we will actually fund your project. And what we have here in this other painting is more or less after the first voyage to the Americas, when they, when Columbus arrived into the Caribbean islands, of course, he brought them kind of some of the riches that he found there. Of course, Columbus wasn't aware that he was arriving into a new place, but nonetheless, what I want to emphasize is that this project could not happen without this public, pro, uh, public, uh, private partnership. So the role that the king, the the queen of Spain, more or less played here is one of yes, particularly funding a bit, outsourcing the project to Columbus, and they were also some private parties that were uh, funding the project. But most importantly, the public aspect is that the crown legitimizes the conquest, and this will be a key aspect to understand the particular ways in which both Portugal and Spain incorporated the whole Americas into their own monarchies. I mean, as this, this, this thing was not unique, of course, to, to, to Spain and Columbus. As I already told you, this happened uh, for all of these uh, travelers across uh, that wanted to travel in, in Europe and they, they had to look for funding. This is Pedro de Cabral, the basically the explorer and found, the one that found basically Brazil, and he's doing the same more or less in this painting with the King of Portugal. So this is more or less what occurred uh, the first trip of Columbus. We know that he more or less arrived into the Bahamas, then he went into Cuba, and then he went into the island of Hispaniola. And then he established one of the first European settlements in La Navidad, which currently is part of IT, and then he went. He will return to the Caribbean, explore a lot of the Caribbean, both into basically the coast of northern uh, Colombia and Venezuela, and even some Suriname and the Guyanas. And he, he, he did a lot of uh, four, uh, like four trips in total. These are the trips that the Portuguese explorers did, which again, I think is quite interesting because before the Spaniards, they already had a long tradition of navigating across the waters. Given their peripheral aspect within Europe, they had a, basically an incentive to do that before anyone else. So the most well-known figure, of course, is the Henry, the King Henry aptly nicknamed the Navigator in the early 15th century, that he already had founded several outposts in the coast of Africa. This will be, of course, quite relevant in understanding not only the development of the Portuguese empire, but more or less the development of the slave trade for the future centuries across Europe. Because these factories, these outposts that the uh, Portuguese would actually found would be crucial to understand the way in which slavery, uh, the slave trade would develop from Africa to America in the following centuries. These are the travels for Bartolomeu Diaz that he arrived all the way into the south of the Africa, but he did not cross it, he returned it. Then most famously, of course, Vasco da Gama was the one that first traveled across the Cape of Good Hope and arrived into India. And of course, the aforementioned Pedro de Cabral, who after Vasco de Gama arrived into India, he wanted to repeat the process. And so given that by the time of Pedro de Cabral, there was already this notion that Columbus maybe had arrived into this different place, there's kind of a debate about why Pedro de Cabral nav navigated more into the Atlantic. And he of course arrived by that uh, into basically Brazil. And he was the first European to arrive into Brazil. And then of course, the, the point of the Portuguese voyages is not to come to this new place, it's really to go to India. And so he, he went to India. <laughs> 
And so after, basically after this travel by uh, Pedro de Cabral, we see that the Portuguese were very interested in just looking into who, what this area was. So a second voyage was commissioned one in which Américo Vespucci was in the in, in said voyage. And in that voyage, um, Américo Vespucci arrived and he thought that this was a new land. And so that is more or less why the land that we call this continent is called America, because he was the first European that consistently told the story that this was not part of Southeast Asia or Asia, but was really a new continent. And of course, more famously, this is the Treaty of Tordesillas and the Division of the World. So this is most well known because it tended to put the structure by which both the Portuguese and the Spanish would kind of set up their own institutions in place, but would also set up the conditions by which the other powers in Europe will have to compete. The first, of course, is the, the, the most important, the Treaty of Tordesillas, the division between West and East, but later on, this was a less well known, but also very much important, the Treaty of Zaragoza which occurred more or less after both the Portuguese had arrived to, to the Moluccan Islands by going south into Africa. And also the first, if you remember the first uh, trip around the world by Magellan, the Portuguese Magellan, which was nonetheless commissioned by the Spanish uh, kingdoms. So Magellan along with Elcano arrived into this area. Magellan of course was killed in the Philippines. So he did not make the whole trip. He, the, the Elcano was kind of the leader of the mission that ended up traveling all around the world. But the conflict was that even that there were these two routes towards the Southeast Asia, that then we needed another point of a border zone between, Europe, between Portugal and Spain, and the, then they created this area. And basically the, the, the Spain would say, well, of course, I accept not to colonize the Moluccan Islands, but, you, would you, but the Portuguese, Spain, a Portuguese king would have to pay some money. Of course, later on in the mid 16th century, the Spanish would actually colonize the Philippines. And given that the Philippines is not as spice rich as the Moluccan Islands and the Indonesia, Papua now, what today is Indonesia and Papua Nova Guinea, then the Portuguese did not have any, any major incentive to actually uh, block the, the, the colonization. And of course, later on between 1580 and 1640, there will be the Iberian Union, which more or less will more pacify the relationships between the Portugal and, uh, and Spain. Uh, let's look a little bit about the conquest. I won't go into the details because I think we already know uh, a lot about it. I just want to mention three points. The first one is we need to look into the concept of the composite, composite monarchies, which is a composite, uh, which is a concept created by the historians Königsberg and Elliot to talk about the idea that at this time, the, the monarchies were not nation states, of course, and the way in which they had to increase their borders, to increase their power to, to acquire territories depended very much on the power to decentralize and allow the peoples that, they were, that were incorporating into their territories to remain very autonomous. So I will read this quote by Adeline Rucois, which I think summarizes quite well this aspect of the Iberian monarchies. She says, the king gathers peoples and therefore territories, substituting their former lords with himself, with no attempt to make them one. He integrates diverse peoples who preserve their differences. He does not need to change the language, customs, or laws, but he does have an imperative duty to ensure the orthodoxy of their faith. I think this is so important because it puts a framework to understand both the process of conquest and the process of creating the governance institutions that will govern the Americas for the following two centuries. So first you need to understand that they will respect a lot of autonomy. They will respect the local languages. There will be a division of power between the people that already lived there and the ones that came also uh, as immigrants. We will look into that in just a moment. But secondly, and perhaps the factor that will tend to unify this whole region would be both the allegiance, of course, to the king, but most importantly, the faith, uh, the orthodoxy of the faith. So of course, there's a, a very important driver towards evangelizing these people. So making these people Catholic is one of the most important aspects. And then hence, you can understand why this was so important for both the Portuguese and the Spanish. So I will skip a little bit about this because we all know the details. I just want to mention a little bit about the conflicts that this creates. And I think the best way to put this conflict is by looking into the South American case. 
So when you outsource government, and this is a topic that we will see in just a moment in more depth, what you see is that the conquistadores themselves that will later become the encomenderos, the de facto rulers of the area that they were conquering, they were looking for riches of their own. They were looking to expand their own riches. So they, of course, they will increase the size of the kingdom that they uh, pay, play, uh, pay allegiance to, but nonetheless, they, they are in for themselves. So that means that there are a lot of conflicts. And so the most important conflicts, it's the one in, in the south of Peru, in between Pizarro and Almagro. So both of them conquered the Incas, but later on, they had conflicts about who will govern the area. And there's a lot of battles and basically murders between the family of Pizarro and the family of Almagro that will have uh, repercussions for the governorship in this area. The, we do not see this in, 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 in North America as well. The other aspect that I want to mention is that even though we tend to look as indigenous people as being conquered, there's a huge aspect of them themselves being conquerors as well. So what, this one, for example, is Nicolás de San Luis de Montañez, which is a conqueror that actually helped the Spaniards conquer parts of Northern Mexico. And I want to emphasize that because it's related to the political structures of the, of the way in which these territories were incorporated. And we will see that a lot of indigenous autonomy remained precisely because they themselves saw themselves not as being conquered, but as an allies, as an enablers of the conquest. So a lot of the ways in which the indigenous people will try to defend their autonomy is by looking into this particular process of creation of Americas, not as an interference by Europeans, but as an alliance of indigenous people along with the Spanish. So moving on, I, the other aspect that I want to emphasize is how the crown acted. So the crown really, they are in Europe. Of course, the kings there could not move to Americas. They are just miles, miles away from that. So they try to both legitimize the process of conquest and also try to arbitrage between, uh, serve as an arbiter between the different parties that are involved in the conflicts. So I think this early division of the Americas, the Spanish Americas, kind of puts that perspective quite nice because of course, given that they are far, far away, they do not know the topography or the geography of the places that were being conquered. So they just divide these areas by latitude. So this is just disregarding all the possibilities. And some things, this is so utopic that uh, even though this map does not mention, there's a subdivision really that goes to the extreme south of South America. So these are places that even now are really not inhabited. So who will want to get into these places? So why is because in a top-down manner, the king in Spain will say, well, we will divide it. We don't know exactly how this is created, but we will divide it in, in, in this way. Of course, this is not the way in which actually the divisions occurred. We will look into that later on in the lecture. And when we look into Portugal, the Brazilian case, a similar thing occurred. So, and I think one particular difference between the Portuguese and the Spanish way of colonization depends very much into the perspectives that the Portuguese have compared to the Spanish. And so the Portuguese were really much interested in going into India and Asia and Southeast Asia. So they arrived into Brazil. They, they knew later on that it was a new continent, but they were not really interested in creating uh, settlements here. They will create them because they, they already had acquired them, but they were more or less seen as kind of outposts that will allow them to have a network of outposts that would make e more easy the voyages to Southeast Asia. And so in that sense, of course, the motivations towards settlement in this area changes quite dramatically. Now, having said that, of course, there's still kind of a division of who would actually get to settle this area. And we see in this way, but yes, a similar pattern as what we see in Spain, which is the people in, in, in the king in Portugal, basically having no knowledge of the geography of the area, he would just divide this, not between the conquerors because they were not really conquerors, but between the nobility in, in Portugal. And they would say, well, there's a lot of land here and I will divide them. Of course, this again is utopic and a lot of these provinces do not survive. These governorships do not survive. Really the most important ones would be in the South, Sao Vicente, and later in the North, this area, first in Bahia and later this area. This will of course lead to a particular development of the Brazilian state into governorships 
rather than by rather than by royalties the, the vice royalty of Brazil really will be created very, very late on in the history of Brazil. So for most of history was just governorships and it would lead towards this division between South and North. In the North, of course, it was uh, the environment was more uh, incentivized more the, the, the occurrence of plantations. And hence later on Brazil would be the place where uh, the first, the most important export of sugar in the world. And that will drive, of course, one of the attempts of the Dutch to encroach in this area. So let's remind us, this is not just a, a conflict between Spain and Portugal. The other countries want a piece of the pie as well. So the Dutch specifically have a lot of enmities with both Portugal and Spain, and they will contest the spaces both in Asia and in America and in Europe, of course, of the Portuguese and the Spanish. And within the America, that gets reflected into the conquest of this area by the Dutch for a couple of decades in the 17th century. Later on, of course, this, uh, this area will become even more populated because there's a gold uh, found here and the driver to basically settle this area would, would occur. But this will occur really late on in the 18th, uh, 18th century. Okay, let's look after conquest, what happened? And the most important aspect of the conquest, the one that has been emphasized the most by historians, both economic historians and regular historians and by demographers, of course, is that we see a catastrophic population decline after the arrival of Europeans. We know that this decline is mostly due to the fact of the spread of infectious diseases, but of course, there's also a role to be said that the violence and the process of the conquest played in it. So it's, it's not a minor one, but the main driver, the main core aspect that explains this collapse is the infection disease spread. Now, this is so important because a lot of people died, as we will see in just a moment. It's important that really the population in the Americas did not uh, recover, it start to recover only after say a couple of centuries after. And there was a transition in the way in which basically the governors uh, in these areas interacted with the local population and with the crown. And this is kind of what we will see in the next part of the lecture. For now, let's just look into the demographic collapse aspect, which, I mean, to put it into perspective, a lot of demographers have talked about the Black Death. I mean, I bet you have heard the Black Death. It killed a lot of the population of Europe. There's a contested idea that maybe the, the, the demographic collapse in the Americas was as large or even larger, depending on how you measure it, compared to, to, to the Black Death. So it was huge. Now, this is quite contested and quite debated because in order to assess the magnitude of the collapse, we first need to know how many people lived previous to the arrival of the Europeans. And we really do not know. We have some estimates. So for example, this is um, some data by Denevan in which he estimates that 53 million people live in the area prior to the arrival of Columbus. And just to have a benchmark of comparison, uh, Debris, for example, estimates that in Europe at the same time uh, had 61 million. This excludes the Russian Ottoman Empire. But this nonetheless gives you the idea that America was populated. They had a lot of population. Of course, it was concentrated as we previously seen in last week lectures into the areas of the Andean and Mesoamerica because those were the places that allowed these complex societies to exist, but it was also spread in other areas. Now, again, this is quite contested. So a lot of more research has been done in terms of looking into the particular populations in specific places. Here we look into the Andes and Mesoamerica and some parts of Central America. And these are kind of estimates about the population that uh, existed prior to the arrival of Europeans. And then we have the population Adir, which is kind of the lowest point in this period that is described here. In, 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 so this kind of speaks about the decline, the, the amount of people that existed prior and the amount of people that existed after the, the, the process of diseases. And this is kind of a ratio that gives kind of an idea of the magnitude. So you have basically, for example, in the coast of the central Andes, the ratio between the people that existed before and the one that remained is 51, 58 to one, which is huge. In other areas equally are large, it's more, less large, large, but equally important, like in lowland Mexico, it's 26. So the magnitudes are quite large. And even if maybe the ratios are quite difficult to grasp, there's another estimate that would look, just look into percentages. So how many people died? And so 
again, this is quite contested. So we have a lot of literature talking about different uh, assessments of it. So Koch and uh, co-authors did a nice bibliographical review of this literature. They themselves estimate that 90% of the pre-Columbian pre pre population died. But if there are some estimates that are lower, that are one says that one third, but I would say that the median would be around 80%, which again is huge. A huge amount of population died and most of it, it was through diseases. So we know, because uh, there's a lot of narratives about what was happening in this time, both by the arriving Europeans and by the pre-existing indigenous population. So this was particularly important, of course, in Mesoamerican Andes. So there were names for these diseases, local names. So the Colitzli and the Matlazahuatl for the Mesoamerican Nahuatls, Guacamatz in the Mayan in Central America, and Rupa in the Quechua area. So there has been also a lot of research about the spread of diseases because this is something that interests not only historians, economic historians, or demographers, but really epidemiologists. Thank you. So so th there's a lot of research about this area, so we 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 understand now that most uh, importantly because of COVID, of course. But there's we know an assessment of basically the particular diseases that prevail in the time. So this is, for example, for the area of central Mexico, we know that the first one wave that occurred was most likely smallpox, but after the 16th century. So before I do that, I want to emphasize that this is a process that occurred throughout the 16th century. So it's not just an event that killed a people. So it's a process of a several diseases that transmit in the Americas and kill and kill and kill a lot of people. And so those are smallpox here, mumps, and the influenza, and diarrhea, and measles, for example. And we know more or less how this was transmitted because we can attest towards the narratives and we know more or less what it impacted first and what impacted later. So the most common way in which the diseases were propagated were mostly from Mexico first, and then they were uh, they, they transmitted to North and South America. And why is that? It's just, just like a today, we tend to think like contact is the main predictor of basically transmission of diseases and contact either through trading routes or just migration of people. It's, it's the easiest way to, to get infected. So it was, of course, it makes sense that from Mexico to the other places, uh, the diseases were transmitted. And we know evidence, for example, when we look about the epidemics in Guatemala, they follow very closely after the epidemics had occurred in Mexico. Now, after the development of these areas had occurred, alternative trade routes, alternative routes started to pop around. So for example, in Peru, one of the most important epidemics was one in the late 16th century. And there's a lot of debate about this, but one current hypothesis is that it was transmitted not from Mexico, but from Cartagena. And why? This is something that I, I have not mentioned, but it is not only the Europeans that are bringing the diseases, but really also the Africans. So it's just not Europeans coming, but the opening of the enslaved trade will also opening, open another way by which diseases from Africa will come to America and also infect a lot of people here. So in this important uh, epidemic of the late 16th century, we know that it started in Cartagena because that's basically the main slave hub for the Spanish America. We'll talk about that in the following slides. And then it went south to Quito, to the rest of Peru, to Bolivia and to Chile. For the Brazilian case, of course, it's a little bit different. I mean, the transmission of the diseases, mostly because there is no direct contact with the Spanish sphere. But again, there's a process of slaves being brought to, to the Americas, and there's a process of a Portuguese coming to America. So for example, one important epidemic is one of the smallpox in the middle of the 16th century that we know it came directly from Lisbon, and it basically propagated through all the Bahia and the Brazilian, a Brazilian coast. And even given that this is quite debated in terms of the estimates of the people that died, an alternative way that we have to assess the impact of the magnitude of people of the demographic collapse is by looking into carbon footprint. So why is that? Because when people die, basically the environment starts to recover. So trees start to grow up again in places where they were uh, being cut down. So basically more carbon is in the environment. And this, uh, there are a lot of research by basically people that do research on the climate and environment that stress that something occurred in the 16th and early 17th century that increased more or less the carbon footprint in the world. And perhaps 
one of the most interesting aspects of the demographic collapse is not itself the magnitude, but what happened afterwards. Because one of the things that we've come to expect after a demographic collapse is that afterwards, population rebounds. There's an overshoot in the fertility rate, given that if we look into the classical Malthusian model, basically a lot of people die, but that implies that basically the ratio of land to labor uh, starts to, to, to change. So the, the size of the pie, uh, there's more pie for everyone involved. So that means that people will start to reproduce more up until they achieve a new equilibrium, right? But we don't see that in the Americas. And this is mostly interpreted by historians as this concept of the desgano vital, which could be roughly translated as a lack of willingness to live. And this is so interesting because we don't have a clear explanation of why this occurred. We know it occurred. We know that this could be explained directly by the increase in infant mortality rates, often by infanticide. So basically people will kill their own children, often just by increasing the contraception methods and abortion rates. But we don't know exactly what caused this uh, indirectly this decrease in, in infant mortality rates. And I found this quote by a local friar in Venezuela, Jose Gomilla, quite enlightening, because he puts it in a very interesting way, the process. He says, where the number of Indians is known to decline, many childless and entirely sterile Indian women are seen, and these are the ones married to Indians. But at the same time, it is recognized in the same places and towns that all the Indian women married to Europeans and to mestizos, quadroons, mulatos, sambos, and also those who marry blacks are so fecund and procreate so much that they can bet to be on par with the most fertile of the Hebrews. Of course, here's the benchmark is the Orthodox Jews. We are famous to having a lot of children. And here, what he's stressing around is that the indigenous women, indigenous people do not procreate. But when we see basically indigenous women having families with, with people that are non-indigenous, they could be European, they could be African, they could be mestizos, they do have children. So there's something particular happening in indigenous populations that they do not want to actually reproduce. And within the narratives that try to interpret this, it is mostly perceived as basically a state of depression. Like they were being conquered, they had been conquered, and they do not want to survive, basically. And this, we do not have an exact answer exactly of why this occurred, but we know that it occurred. And we know that there was, of course, a huge decrease in the amount of indigenous population. But what about people coming into Americas? So when we look into population patterns, it's not just people born, people dying, it's people migrating to. What we know is that not enough people came to America to really uh, supplant the population that, that died in demographic collapse. But we know that a lot of people came. And so these are some estimates about the Iberian immigration in the first place. For example, from Chaunu and Chaunu and from Myrner, we know that by the 17th century, almost a quarter of a million Spaniards had arrived into the Americas. Of course, the problem here is that they look into the data of the voyages themselves. So they were looking into the passages, the trips themselves to how many people were in each ship, but people came and people left. So it's, this is not, this does not amount to the whole population that stayed and live within the Americas in the 16th century. So for that, we look into other estimates. So for example, Lopez de Velasco, which was kind of the official historian of Philip II, the King of Spain, more or less estimates that there were 23 thousand households inhabiting in the Americas at the end of the 16th century, which more or less, if we, could, we, we think of a ratio of six persons per household, it leads to uh, 140,000 inhabitants living in Spanish America. If we compare that to the Portuguese area, and precisely because of the reasons that I told you just before, there's not enough emphasis towards settlement. Of course, we tend to expect that there will be much more less people in Portuguese America. So at the same time, we have estimates that 20,700 Portuguese inhabited the area. And they were mostly located in the areas in Bahia, Pernambuco, and Sao, Paulo, and Sao Vicente. Now, we will look into who the profiles of the people that came first, of course, we tend to find a very skewed distribution in distribution in favor of men. So why? Just natural, tend to think about who will risk to basically come into this area. It, this will not be families. 
it will you be basically single men that want to venture and just find the riches by their own. So it's very, very skewed. So Boyd Bowman, for example, estimates that out of all the Spanish uh, inhabitants that came to America, only 16.5% in the early 16th century were women. This, of course, will start to change later on because as things got more peaceful, more settled, institutions were put in place for governing this area, while there are more incentives for families to arrive. If we look into a more disaggregated areas uh, of where these uh, Spanish Americans, uh, where the Spanish arrive into the Americas, we'll tend to see a coincidence in terms of the areas that were already populated before. And again, so uh, almost 34, for example, percent of the Spanish arrive into the areas of Mexico and 23% arrive into the areas of Peru. So here, of course, we are talking about the pre-Columbian emphasis about geography and the pre-Hispanic aspects also matter a lot in creating the conditions for the Spanish to arrive or the Portuguese to arrive in the very first place. We also know how a little bit about where they came from. And I know that this may change in the coming future because I know of a group of economic historians, Jose Antonio Sanchez Pin in Yale and Leticia Arroyo Abad in the City University of New York that have more access to more uh, granular data about people coming to, from Spain to, to the Americas. But so far, kind of our ideas is that most of them came from southern Spain. So 36% from just Andalusia and 15% from Extremadura and another 30% from the core area of Castile. So a lot of them mainly came, came from southern Spain. But there were also a, an interesting enough a, a, a foreigner component because specifically in this time, in the uh, mid 16th century, who governed Spain basically, well, it was Charles I of Spain, but also Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire. And he was an Habsburg. So of course he had a lot of connections with nobility and bankers in Germany, but also across Europe. So of course he wanted also to privilege that connection. So for example, more famously, the area that today is Venezuela would be initially settled by the German people that they were given kind of license by Charles I to settle into that area. But of course, it was not just a European that came into America. So a lot of Africans came to America. So most famously, and something that maybe we not tend to think about it, but one of the corollaries of the Treaty of Tordesillas that divided the world between the Portuguese and the Spanish is that really the Spanish could not commercialize directly within Africa. So they could not transport slaves from Africa to America. So they had to rely on third parties. Initially, of course, first the Portuguese that had uh, the access the most to, to, to that area. But later on, there were this thing called asientos, where asientos uh, de esclavos, which were licenses sold by the Spanish crown to basically sell enslaved people in Spanish America. And this will be a huge deal because there will be a lot of competition between the European powers in order to provide uh, slaves to the Americas. And because of that, would you see a, a, a hub to start to be developed in Cartagena, in what today is Colombia, as the main slave hub and the place in which slaves would come and then they will actually be transported to other places across the Americas. So one early estimates of the amount of slaves in the 16th century, we know from Bowser, that 35,000 35, slave persons live with Mexico and almost 100,000 in Peru. Lima alone, had half of its population being uh, was a slave. So it was a, a huge amount. We also know that really there were kind of enslaved Asians. So we know a little less about it, a lot about figures. And this will really start to appear in the mid 16th century after the conquest of the Philippines. So we do not know a, a, a lot of data about that, but enslaved Asians also were a thing within the Americas. Now, when we compare with the Portuguese, if we just look into absolute figures, the amount of the Brazilian uh, slavery trade was minor at this point. It was just 50,000 slave persons. But we, we, when you put it into relative terms, just think into the amount of population of Europeans living in, in Spanish America and Portuguese living in Brazil, you will see that the ratio since the very beginning is already skewed for the Brazilian case to be more uh, based more in, in economy based on slaves rather than the Spanish. And this, of course, this will skyrocket in the following centuries when the plantations will really become a thing uh, 
later on in the 17th century. And of course, they will skyrocket even more after the independence of Brazil. So what determines the slavery patterns in the Americas? This is something that I will cover in, our, in the following slides. But kind of a preview of that is that we really need to look into the areas, the resources, how productive the resources are there. Just look into why should we actually uh, have slavery? So the extraction of silver, the production of sugar, those are highly productive goods that actually are quite um, profitable in, in that regard. So that will be one constraint. The other one that Arias and Giro also emphasize is the pre-existing institutions that both enabled and also may have a blocked the slavery of local indigenous population. So you see, again, there is kind of a pattern that explains more or less where some places relied much more on indigenous population or an important African enslaved, enslaved people. So if you want to know, and this of course creates a very complex aspect of the demography of the area. So when you look into the problems of today about inequality with a racial component that of course is common all across the Latin American countries, this is of course is where this starts from because we start from the very first uh, process of creating or nations or states or societies, a very demographic diversity that is unequal in the way in which it is distributed. So of course we have the Europeans, we have or we have the indigenous population, but we have also people from both Asia and in the Africa coming into this area. And of course we have conflicts between themselves because they are different set of people. Perhaps what I want to mention that I think is kind of a distinct from this, the, the point of view of the, coloni the colonial era is that really what mattered the most in this point of time is really to belong to an area that supported, legally supported you. So what you would see, and this is something that I will explain in just a moment when I talk about the governors and the institutions of governance in the, in the Americas, is what you will see is that two institutions will be created mostly. One of Republic of Spaniards and one of Republic of Indians. And these are legal creatures with their own jurisdictions. So if you belong to one of these aspects, you are kind of legally protected. And so the one, aspect that where you will not be protected, for example, if you are a mestizo. So nowadays, of course, it's common to think of Latin American societies are being basically the product of the mestizaje, which is true. But in this time, really, the mestizo was seen kind of an outcast. Why? Because there wasn't a legal figure for the mestizo. The mestizo just was a, a, a mixture between populations. So the indigenous area, the scope of governance was clearly defined. The governance area, the scope of governance area for the Spaniards of the Europeans was clearly defined, but it was not clearly defined for the mestizo. And I think the one book that captures that argument quite well is the one by John Rappaport that does an investigation into the racial component of the colony of New Granada later on. Um, yeah, if you want to check into these books, I find them quite interesting to understand the origins of the racial complexities of Latin America. And if moving a little forward, just to look into a preview of how we get into the complexities in terms of figures, you will see that this explains more or less why some societies rely are more indigenous than others. For example, by on the eve of independence of the Spanish uh, Americas, you see that what are the more indigenous populations? Of course, there are the ones in Mexico, in Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia. But you see some components in South America uh, here, Chile, but also kind of Argentina, of course, Rio de la Plata, that they do not have a lot of indigenous population. They do have a lot of European population, and particularly Brazil and basically the northern parts of South America, basically Venezuela, they had a large component of African people. So how do we understand this? We need to look into the past. We need to look in how this basically both the slave trade and how we use forced labor in, in, in several ways to account for these complexities. So now moving on into trying to explain the process of state building in Latin America. And this may look like just an historical problem to you, but this is something that has created a legacy that the open or, no, or nations. If you look into conflicts that exist today in some of our countries, most famously, of course, in Colombia, but also in Mexico and in some parts of Latin, in Central America, about the central government not having enough control of all the areas that technically are, are nominally controlled by the government. Well, we need to look into the past. 
And we need to look into how the, these places were initially governed. And so I think we have three main factors. So we last section, last lecture, last week, we talk about the pre-Hispanic political economy, which is important because it puts the foundations that were later being ad adapted by the Spaniards. We have already talked more or less about the Spanish coming, the Spanish and Portuguese coming into the Americas with their own culture and their own institutions and adapting themselves into this pre-Hispanic context. And of course, we also have the natural endowment component because that is kind of the main driver that basically the arrival of the Europeans want to take advantage of. And of course, here we see the trying to extract the most of the silver, dyes, tobacco, and sugar. This will be the main components that will articulate the routes, the trading routes that will actually make the, um, the both the Portuguese and the Spanish empire possible in the first place. So one of the key questions that we need to ask ourselves is how did few hundred Spaniards build a new state? When you look into the immigration, and you look into how few of them came actually. And when you look into the indigenous population, even after the fact that many of them, of course, died because of diseases, there's still a skewed ratio of a lot more population in a lot of these areas existing compared to the immigrants. So you see, you ask yourself, how did they do it? And so of course, the one that we tend to emphasize the most is that there's of course a violent component and there's a threat of violence. But I, the one, and this is so obvious that I won't elaborate on them on it. But what I want to emphasize is that there is a huge component of co-opting local elites. So again, this is where I think it's quite important to remember the slide that I presented about the composite monarchies. So the way in which the Iberian monarchies came and conquered and incorporated these territories is by telling the new conquered people, I will respect your traditions. I will respect your customs. I will respect your law. I mean, you will be evangelized. That's my main driver. You will become Catholic. But with your internal political organization, that will be respected. And in fact, if you help me, you will actually be participative of the same exploitative process that we will engage in. So it is through this co-opting of the local elites that previously existed that the Spaniards get to build their state in the very first place. And we will talk in just a moment how that led to a lot of complexities because we have a lot of actors being involved. Uh, we have the uh, conquerors coming, wanting to create a fiefdom of their own. We have the crown that legitimizes the conquest, but wants also to govern itself. We have the indigenous population that wants to maintain their own rulership of their own lands. And it creates a very complex governing system that creates a lot of conflicts and it's solved in a, in a very interesting way. And of course, you also have the missionaries that we'll talk in just a moment. So we have a strong, of course, a religious component that also legitimizes part of the conquest. So the encomienda system, and I think this is one of the key aspects that the literature on colonization tends to emphasize, because of course, the negative connotations are so obvious. So it is often perceived as an exploitative regime because there are people, Europeans, coming to the Americas and basically forcing local indigenous population to work for them. That is basically the encomienda. The main purpose I already explained when I talk about the process of reconquista within Spain and the conquest of the Canary Islands, the, 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 ration, the economic rationale for the crown to actually rely on this is because it's an instrument of indirect rule. And again, just think about it. So Spain and Portugal are so far away from the Americas. So there's no way that they could actually control directly what the things that are occurring in Americas. So you need to rely in a third party to actually conquer those places in place and govern those places for you. So it's a way to outsource government to the people that had conquered. So in that regard, the conquistadores became the early encomenderos. So the encomenderos basically had the task of, they would receive, of course, forced labor in payment, but in exchange, they will provide kind of security, some sort of basic public goods to the people that they are technically protecting. And so they will govern the populations. Uh, however, of course, this is a threat to the crown at the end of the day. So why? Because the crown, yes, they legitimize the process of conquest, but the crown has an incentive towards trying to govern these areas by themselves, by a more direct approach. So there's a conflict being created between the early conquistadores that, com that converted in encomenderos and the crown. And you can most famously explain this through the signing by Charles I of the Leyes Nuevas, the new laws, that the jury extinguished the category of the commandero within the Spanish America. And when I said extinguishes, basically stating that 
the encomenderos will remain, uh, will, will remain, will, will have the privileges as long as they live, but they will not be able to inherit those privileges to their uh, children. And of course, this created a lot of conflict. One of the most famous cases is in Peru. So after there was a civil war between the early conquistadores, remember Francisco Pizarro and Diego de Almagro, there was another conflict. Charles I wanted to actually rule Peru by, by a more direct approach. So he sends the first viceroy to Peru. He creates the viceroy of Peru. And he says, I will govern directly this area through my viceroy. And he arrives and the encomenderos here do not like it. Of course, they, people do not like to be said uh, what to do, especially if they have already conquered this place. So they actually imprison the viceroy and they return it to Panama. From Panama, the viceroy escapes he goes to Ecuador, he musters an army, and he fights. This is one of the engravings that depicts the Battle of Iñaquito, uh, close to Quito, Ecuador. In this battle, the Viceroy is killed by Gonzalo de Pizarro, so one of the youngest half-brothers of Pizarro. And so you see, this is a conflict, direct conflict between the early conquistadores and the crown, which again is quite interesting. Later on, uh, Charles I would appoint another uh, Viceroy that would muster another army, and then will actually consolidate the power of the Viceroy over the encomenderos. But uh, this is just to state the fact that there was a conflict between the crown and the encomenderos. There has been a lot of research done about this. One recent economic history research is by Francisco Garfia and Amy de Sellers, which more or less, uh, they look specifically into the area of central Mexico, and they more or less uh, assess, empirically assess that the encomienda system dwindled in this area mostly because of the indigenous demographic collapse that I previously explained. And why? Why does that occur? How is this related? First, it's because it reduces the encomendero rights. Why? So if the indigenous population die, the resources that the encomendero could extract from the local population reduces also. And hence, it also reduces the strategic benefits of indirect rule. So there are less people. That means that basically outsourcing the government now it is, 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 is not as needed as it used to. Because if you have a lot of local population, then you have to have local parties involved in governing that. But if you now have lesser population, then maybe you do not need to outsource as much. So this basically, this demographic collapse paradoxically creates kind of a window of opportunity for the crown to actually it try to reform the way in which the encomendero system work. And so, for example, Gibson, uh, in his famous book about the Aztecs after the conquest, he says that the Repartimento and the Mita in Peru are created at basically at this rotational labor systems that more or less try to revert control to the ethnic señorios. So what he emphasizes is that more or less the crown wants to create kind of an alliance with indigenous people that want to empower them more against the encomiendas and hence the huge complexities of the actors here. It's not just Europeans and indigenous. It's there are some Europeans that have conflicts between themselves and there are some indigenous that have conflicts between themselves. And the crown would actually create alliances with indigenous in order to go against the privileges against the encomenderos. And of course, it will also tend to solve, given that the demographic collapse leads to lend less labor, it will tend to solve some of the labor shortage problem, problems that we see in this, uh, in this time. Of course, we also tend to see the repartimento and meta system in a negative light because at the end of the day, it's still kind of forced labor. Now the repartimento and meta is forced labor by the viceroy or by the official governments. It's not uh, owed to the encomendero or the conquistador, it's owed to the specific government. And those kind of a centralization. What we will later see, and this I think find particularly interesting, is we see kind of a difference occurring in Mexico compared to Peru. So for example, in Mexico, what you see, and this is where the pre-Hispanic in heritage matters the most, because as I previously talked about in the last lecture, the Incas already had the Mita system. So they already had a system that relied in forced labor. And a lot of literature more or less has emphasized that there are a lot of differences between the Spanish Mita system that was put in place in the late 16th century and the Inca Mita system. So there are key differences. One of them is that basically with the Incas, the Incas relied on forced labor that produced public goods that technically would benefit the people that they were laboring on. And they basically, the forced labor were really very close by to their local communities. 
In the Spanish meta system, really many people will be moved very far away from their local populations and it will be mostly extractive. So it will be just to basically extract silver uh, for the benefit, for the profit of the miners and the merchants in Peru. So that's one key difference that of course matters. But nonetheless, there's still a cultural acceptance that meta forced labor system is a thing. When you look into Mesoamerica, there's no such a pre-Hispanic institution. So Aztecs conquered, but they relied on payment through goods. So there was a lot of tribute, but it was tribute in kind, not in forced labor. So that meant that when the repartimento system was established in Mexico, forced labor was established in Mexico, there was much more reluctance to accept it in the very first place. And so moving far away distance from their indigenous localities was not a thing. So if you want to take uh, the, the classical way to understand this is through a Marxian lens, by which basically the people, the indigenous communities actually given that all of these taxes are basically owed by the community and not by individuals, there's an incentive for the, indig the indigenous individual to actually move away from the indigenous community and became kind of an individual. So that means that he's landless now on. So if he wants to survive, then he needs to go and find labor and find a market for labor. So what you see is that in the 17th century, mid 17th century, in central Mexico, you will see that there is an increasing reliance of labor markets, despite the labor shortage problem, which again would not occur in Peru. In Peru, what would occur is that they will still rely on this forced labor system for, for the upcoming centuries, which again, is, is I, I found quite interesting. Uh, Carfias and sellers also explain kind of some of these differences due to the fact that demographic collapse did not hit all the areas in the same way. So here they contrast what occurred in central Mexico with what occurred in the Central America Mayan area of Yucatan. And then hence they correlate basically the idea of how many people died. And they say, well, they, a lot of people died in all, in all areas, but they died mostly in basically central Mexico and northern parts of Mexico, not really in the Yucatan area. So the relative impact in the Yucatan area was much lower. So what you see here is kind of a measurement of how much the, the viceroyalties or the, the hierarchy of the Spanish government could actually govern in those places rather than in Comenderos. So, so, so what you see then is that within the central Mexico, you see an extinction of the Encomendero, but not in Yucatan in Central America. And this will be of course also a very important aspect that will define some of the Yucatan area for centuries, even after independence. So to summarize what we've been talking about, what we see is that there is a superimposition of new political realities into this old pre-Hispanic system that creates a dual political system. One that relies in what I call the Republic, well, not I call the literature calls the Republic of Indians. I've done a little bit of research on this, but my argument is more or less based on the historian Bernardo Garcia Martes, Mar Martinez that emphasizes that there is kind of a continuity between the old pre-Hispanic world and the old pre-Hispanic towns surviving into the colonial period and later even into the independence. And they will form kind of the counties that we now see in central, in, in, in central Mexico. But we all, he also stresses that maybe the same thing occurs in the Andes. This is one area. The other area is the Republic of Spaniards, which basically the Corregimentos is the public office that basically, uh, ex replaces the encomenderos as the local granular way to govern uh, localities that basically where, where the Spanish are settled. And these will be public offices that will be paid and, and appointed by the royal treasuries. I'm gonna skip this. So at the end of the day, I, I guess this is kind of a neat figure from um, Jenny Guardado that has done some of research on the way in which the Spanish government, both in Peru and in Mexico. And he, I, I think the, this, this, this figure puts it well, the, the, the hierarchy of how the Spanish empire was governed. So of course, at the top, we have the main legitimizer, the king. But who aids the king is mostly the Council of the Indies. The Council of the Indies was created really in the early parts of the 16th century to aid the king um, in matter of war, in matter of taxes, and in matter of governance in the Americas. That's one strong component. Second strong component is the Casa de Contratación, the House of Trade. 
that will rule more or less the way in which the government, in which the metropolis in Spain will interact in terms of trade routes with the rest of the Americas. We will see that in next Thursday. Carlos Marichal is one of the foremost experts on, on, on this topic in, in just trying to understand the, the commercial aspects of the Spanish Empire. And within the Spanish Americas themselves, we see these hierarchies. First, what we see is these real audiencias. So we see audiencias being created all across the Spanish Americas, first in the capitals of the vice royalties, of course, Lima and Mexico City, then in the capitancies, the general capitancies. The general capitancies are different political jurisdictions within Spanish America, and they are created mostly to defend those areas. So the general, uh, the capitan generals are mostly appointed to in matters of war. They do not have a power in other regards, but they have power in, in terms of the defense of these areas. So you see, of course, them being located in the northern parts, in the Caribbean, in the southern parts, so Chile, eh, Venezuela, Yucatan. These are locations that are very prone to pirate attacks. So you need a lot of, uh, of defense and spending on war. And there are audiencias in those places as well. And you also see a third uh, type of audiencias, what are called uh, the audiencias subordinadas. They are subordinated just because the vice royalties are so huge. Most importantly, in South America, Peru. Initially, Peru basically is almost all South America. So you would need to have uh, audiencias in other places. What are the audiencias? Are basically law courts. They are both criminal and civil law courts that will tend to resolve conflicts in those areas. So at the end of the day, these areas is where basically you would see a, some sense of you, political unity based around the idea that they already had established system of law that depends upon these specific audiencias. So if you look, for example, after independence, how the countries got fragmented into the Spanish American countries, they mostly follow a pattern that follows the locations of the borders between the different audiencias. And the audiencia, of course, uh, we also have the provincial governor, which basically will rule over the corregimentos. So each locality will have a public official appointed by the by, by the audiencia and by the king. And the viceroy will basically be, uh, will be the one that will be ruling above the audiencia and above the governors. These lines here are quite interesting because you see that a lot of corruption existed in this time. And so Jenny Guardado particularly has done a lot of research and office selling. And basically he has a stress about the importance on reliance of office selling for basically enriching the coffers of the Spanish Empire. So what you see is that the Spanish King will sell the public offices to be appointed in the Real Audiencia and basically as basically corregidores in several places across the Americas. Why would they do that? Is even though they have more control than relying on the on, on the encomenderos as previously, they still kind of need a lot of resources. So remember in the 16th century specifically, there are a lot of wars that Spain is fighting in Northern Europe. Uh, there were wars of religion were a thing. So Flanders was a very important aspect. So there's a lot of need of funds. And so one way to acquire liquidity is by selling these offices. And why would someone would want to actually get these offices? Is because remember, the comienda system was abolished, but not the repartimento, not the mita. So really the extraction of rents was centralized into this hierarchy, but the extraction of rents was still a thing. So if you were a governor, actually you will be in charge of getting those rents. So that means that actually at the end of the day, you will profit. You will pay a lot to get that appointment, but then you will recoup what you spend by just the rents that you could stack from the people. And again, Jenny Gordado has made a lot of research on the negative impact in the long term, specifically in Peru, about the selling of these offices. Now, one final aspect of the political jurisdiction uh, of, of the govern, governing the Americas is the church. So as I've previously stressed, one important aspect of just legitimizing the conquest and colonization of the Americas is that basically the Spanish Empire and the Portuguese Empire had just one, one motive, to evangelize people. That is the one thing that legitimizes the whole conquest. So in, in order to do that, of course, they require the aid from missionaries and from the church. These are mostly not the secular church, but the mendicant orders. So we have a long tradition of missionaries coming since the very first beginning of the process of conquest to the Americas and establishing settlements, missions all across the America. So we have evidence of Mercedarian, Franciscans, Dominicans, 
Augustinians, Carmelites, Hieronymites coming to America. Most famous of them all, of course, are the Jesuits. They came really late, late on. In, in, they were not the first to come. They first arrived into Brazil and they later established into Spanish America. But then you'll see that the complexities that we already explained get even more complex but because we have what we call, what we in the literature of political jurisdictions, we call overlapping jurisdictions. We have both the state and the church having some sort of different responsibilities upon a different, uh, uh, the same space. And this creates, again, also a lot of conflict. Uh, because, for example, this you will see most likely, most importantly in South America, in the border zones between the Portuguese area and the Spanish area. So you could say more or less that Paraguay and Uruguay were more or less created as states, as buffer zone states between the border zones between Portugal and Spain, and later on, of course, between uh, Brazil and Argentina or Rio de la Plata. And so there are a lot of complexities there. And the people that really settle in those areas are mostly initially are missionaries. And so you see, for example, this example I gave you, you have Portuguese Jesuits trying to basically evangelize indigenous people against Spanish Jesuits trying to evangelize people. So what the Portuguese and the Spanish will ask themselves, are these guys uh, loyal to our, our state or kingdom, or are they loyal really to their order, the Jesuits in this case? So the, I'm, 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 playing, I'm, I'm, I'm saying about the Jesuits because they are the most famous because in the 18th century, they were expelled from both the Spanish and the Portuguese emperor. So this, for this famous Tabor affair, which in Portugal, there was an attempt on the life of the Portuguese king, uh, a, a person associated, a person high in the hierarchy, we associated with the high hierarchy of the Jesuits was found guilty of attempting to kill the king. So the Portuguese were quite to act and basically outlaw the presence of Jesuits within the Portuguese empire. And they were quickly followed by the outlawing both in France and Spain, the same Bourbon family, but outlaw the presence in the Spanish Empire. So the Jesuits were expelled in the late 18th century. And so you can see that how this creates another threat to the crown. So just like the conquerors, the conquerors and the commanders create a threat to the governance systems, just the same will be created by the, the religious. And when you look into the 18th century, 19th century, after independence, the fight between the liberals and conservators all across Latin America, that more or less even persists today, can be understood by this way. How does the regular, the church actually is loyal to the state and not to their own interests? So that's one particular interesting to note. Another one that relates to the indigenous people is that specifically in the Amazonas, what you will see is that they would have an improved position upon the way in which they will bargain over their local autonomy. So why is that? Just tend to think, if you are an indigenous population in the middle of Amazonas, and then the Spanish Jesuits come to you and they say to you, well, we will evangelize you and we will offer you these terms. And they, the indigenous population will say, yes, that's okay, but you need to improve upon those terms because the Portuguese already came yesterday and they offered me a better deal. I will remain more autonomous. I will actually have to pay less taxes. And I actually maybe even have a more power than my neighbors. So this is not just about indigenous against Spaniards or against, or against Portuguese or Europeans or against the church. It's really also between the indigenous people. So again, this is why this is so complex. But the position of the indigenous people is improved because they now can play both the Portuguese and the Spanish. They can improve the terms of their evangelization uh, upon better terms. You don't see that in happening in Northern in Mexico, for example, because there are no... There are no alternatives there. Basically, there's, there's only the, the Spanish. There are some competition. We do not know a lot about competition within this, uh, the economic competition between these many orders because they also are trying to compete for, for evangelize these different areas, but not among different states. So for example, this is a slide from Felipe Valencia, which will be a lecturer in, our, our, in, in the last section of our course. And he more or less documents how basically different orders came to America. And here he, we can see more or less that the first to come really in mass were the Franciscans, but later on, and this is why it was very worrisome for both the Portuguese and the Spanish, how the, the Jesuits were acquiring a power. So this has also led to a lot of stories about the long trajectories in terms of economic development. 
both in North Mexico and in South America. I'm going to look specifically into the case of South America because I guess this is kind of the canonical case. Again, Felipe Valencia has done a lot of research on this area and he has found that there has a positive impact of the G suites in the area here. Uh, these are kind of G-suite positions all across uh, uh, South America. Again, these are border zones between the Portuguese uh, and the Spanish. But looking into this particular area that later would become Argentina, Brazil, and Paraguay, and was initially settled by the G-suites, and they were expelled, so they had to leave, there's kind of a long-term positive uh, correlation, you would say causality, between the G-suites and more education in this area, more development. You don't see that in in Northern Mexico. And one of the explanations is that we tend to associate the Jesuits basically with education of the general population. And that's what they did in these areas, but they did not do that in Mexico. In Mexico, what they did mostly is that they focus really on educating the elite. So they were mostly in missions that the whole mission was to educate the elite sector within their localities. This is from a research by Maria Waldinger that has done on the economic impact of the missions within Mexico. The, she has kind of located all the missions by the Franciscans, Dominicans, and Augustinians, and the Jesuits. And he more or less, she more or less concludes that she finds actually that there's a positive uh, correlation, there's a positive effect of missions by these mendicant orders, because these missions, they did a lot of work with local populations, but at the base level. The Jesuits, when they arrive, they focus very much on educating the leads. And so he don't see a lot of long-term returns towards what they did in Mexico, unlike what they did in South America, which was positive. And this is a photo from Paraguay. There are a lot of uh, ruins, just ruins in Paraguay. They are quite beautiful. I would recommend you to visit them. And I guess I will end the, the lecture here today. If you want to know more about the complexities between the missions and the state, I would recommend you to look into these books that look both into South America, the Portuguese area, and the Spanish area, and within Mexico. And with that, I finish my lecture. Thanks. Thank you very much, Fernando. Uh, we have several questions, so let me start by yeah, Ivan. Let's, let's by what ones are still open. Okay. Okay, perfect. Yes, uh, uh, please continue sending us uh, your questions. So we have a question by Oscar Valdez uh, about repartimientos. So did the repartimientos and Mita replace the encomienda or did they coexist from the beginning of colonization? No, they will replace them. The whole point of the repartimiento and the Mita is that they want to basically overthrow the power of the encomenderos, but they want to centralize the forced labor aspect from being from the indigenous populations to the encomendero, from uh, to basically being from the indigenous populations to the central government system. So it will, it's, I mean, they, they could coexist in different areas, but not in the same specific area. The whole point is was for them to be replaced. Okay, thank you very much, Fernando. We have another question by Wolfram Menezes. I'm going to reframe the question. So uh, the question is, the dissolvement of, of encomiendas was among the reasons why the local elite looked for independence in the early 19th century. So could you rephrase that, sorry? So uh, we have the, the dissolvement, uh, basically the end of encomiendas. So yes. do you consider that that was among the reasons why the local elite uh, was looking for independence in the end of the colonial period or in the early 19th century? Or, okay, okay yeah. I mean, I mean is, is there any correlation? Some of the conquistadores and the early encomenderos kind of became nobles. And so, yes, but a lot of them, their families, again, they did not inherit the privileges of their fathers. So there is not enough connection between them and really the persons that would later try to independ. But we can trace more or less the seeds that would later become the main factors towards independence here, of course. It mostly through the fact, like when we look into the idea of composite monarchies, the one thing that it is emphasized is that this is a government that is kind of decentralized. It's a government that relies on local units that remain to be autonomous. So not just looking into the encomenderos, but also into the corregidores and into the indigenous population, and even into the reales audiencias. So for example, one of the things that we see, and I have read about this, 
after uh, basically Napoleon invades Spain in the early 19th century, what you see is people in Argentina, for example, in Rio de la Plata would say that, well, I, we owe loyalty to the Spanish king, but that does not imply that we are the same territory as Mexico. We don't know anything to Mexico or New Spain. So we kind of have a right to self-governance and we don't, we are not kind of the same nation state. We, we, uh, we pledge loyalty to the king, but not to the other institutions that are surrounded. So the legitimizer of the union is the king. And some of the early independentist movements across the Americas more or less trying to emphasize this idea, this idea that the only thing that st stuck together the, the, the empire was basically the king. And absent the king, there was no possibility of remaining uh, together. Okay, thank you very much, Fernando. We have two questions related with corruption. So I maybe we can combine uh, they both. So how extended was corruption during the colonial era? Uh, do you think that uh, uh, we can say that there is a legacy uh, uh, about that? Sorry, is there any persistent? And related with that, so do you think that the uh, Corruption so was maybe associated with this practice of tax farming or selling of office. Yeah, so so this is a hard question because I really don't know. I mean, there's obvious kind of a correlation between the past and the present in terms of cultural legacies, but I don't know. It is difficult to measure corruption, just like looking into the profit motives. So I've done a little bit of research on that by looking into into some area that I've not I didn't have time to explore about the Ganila Malion. Basically, the, the, Ganil, the Manila Galleons was a ship that united Peru, Mexico with the Philippines, and later Mexico and the Philippines alone. And it was quietly regulated, but there were some bad incentives for the captains of the ships to actually overload and delay basically the departure of the ships. So that meant that, why is that? Because even though it was heavily regulated, there was an incentive for them to extract a lot of rents. And this was, I mean, the trade between uh, Spain, the Spanish America and the Chinese was very profitable. So there were a lot of incentives to try to extract a lot. And so the way in which we approach that problem is by looking into the shipwrecks and how many of these ships actually get to do the whole, to complete the voyage from the Manila to Acapulco in Mexico. And the amount of ships that either get shipwrecked or never complete the voyage is quite large compared to similar trips from similar places and even from the Atlantic. So the amount of corruption that must have existed is large just by looking into the shipwrecks. But this is kind of a proxy way that we have to measure. So uh, it, it, again, it's hard to assess the importance of it. We know that it was quietly extended because the other the other thing is that there were kind of incentives to, to, to do that, both a kind of institutionally, like what Jenny Guardada does with the office selling in Peru uh, and Spain, and also in terms of localities, just looking to, we there's a huge amount of contraband that we cannot properly assess because there's obvious, given that it's contraband, there's not enough data about how large it was. So this is a very difficult question, but undoubtedly it has a powerful consequences in the long run. Thank you very much, Fernando. We have another question by Jose Gregorio Oropesa. So the question is about the how influential other countries or other European countries were in in the Spanish America. So basically, how uh, influential was Britain and France at uh, that time? So we know that, for instance, during the I mean the Napoleonic Wars, of course, that have an impact on the Spanish America. But I mean. More generally speaking, so yeah. uh, during the whole colonial period, so how influential these countries were? So, I mean, the, I mean, there are two questions here. First, how influential they were in conquered territories that supposedly were either Portuguese or, or, or Spanish. And more or less starting in the middle of the 17th century, they start to colonize both North America and they start to colonize some parts of the Caribbean. Jamaica is one of the first areas that's got colonized. The colonization, the, 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 colonization, the conquest of Jamaica by the English actually, they first attempted to conquer, I think, Cuba. They failed, of course, because Cuba was quite good defended, but Jamaica is, was not as well defended, so it was conquered. And from then on, the English, the French, and the Dutch start to poach territories from both the Spanish and Portuguese. Like we, we look today, like Belize, which is just south of Mexico. Again, we do not, those places, we don't even think of them. But there are places 
they were originally called British Honduras and they were poached from the captaincy of Guatemala. If you look into Northern South America, you see the Guyanas and Suriname. So you have the, the original Guyana is English, the French Guyana is still part of France, is French and Suriname is basically Dutch. So there are attempts to, to, to poach on those land. And Brazil, which I think I mentioned also, there's a brief period of Northern Brazil that was actually Dutch. The period is known as Dutch Brazil because that area was wholly conquered by the Netherlands. So by the past time, we see a weakening of both the Portuguese and the, Sp the, the Spanish that led towards more conquest in several territories. So th that is one way in which I interpret the, the question. The second way is how indirectly the, 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 the ideas or the, con the, the competition between the, of the world actually impacted upon the, 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 the territories in in how impacted the governance governing the territories in the Spanish Americas. And there were different indirect ways in which this occurred. So for example, this is particularly important after the Seven Years War. You could explain more or less that after the Seven Years War where basically both Manila and the Havana, which were the stronghold positions of Spain in Asia and in the Caribbean, they were basically besieged and kind of conquered by the English, there was kind of an attempt to reform the empire, trying to make it more modern, trying to make it more centralized, even more than what we see today, even than what we see here. So this is part of the Bourbon reforms within the Spanish America, but also within Portugal. So the Pambolin reforms, for example, even to Portugal at this time in the 18th century, it was an ally of the British. They themselves fear more or less that they could suffer kind of the same brat that, uh, that, that the English had. Uh, uh, had done with the Spanish. So they also tried to modernize. So that's one way in which the conflict for the world kind of shaped how the Spanish Americas and the Portuguese Americas were governed. Okay. Thank you very much, Fernando. Uh, with that answer, we will conclude our lecture today. Thank you very much to everybody. And I encourage you to come back on Thursday for our seminar with Professor Carlos Marichal, also on the colonial period. Thank you very much.